distracted with the pandemic and the lockdowns and you know I think it's about a year now isn't it, that we've been back. I think we came back last year, wasn't it? Last year though, that's when I remember going. Yeah, before. Yeah. yeah. Fully anyway, so hallelujah. Young people are gonna make their way out now. I don't know who's who's doing it today. Irene will be Well, do you know what? It seemed, we went away for a few days during the week. It feels like I've not been here for ages. <laughs> I've not missed the service. <laughs> and we had some fun because where, where the caravan park is, it's, in, it's like the moors and it's, it's so desolate. And all that's out there is sheep. <laughs> and, and we had so much fun. We're driving down the road and, and, and right in the middle of nowhere there's a little farm and it's right on a bend and as we're coming down the hill chugging along next minute there's about 500 sheep running at us <laughs> with a skate uh, and, and the farmer come on a, a, one of those uh, four wheel drive things and, and he's got a squad bike and, he, and he's going oh, up on the first time the dog's trying to get them and I thought I don't know what to do, they're running out of me alright <laughs> they're like cow streets with a week at Malcolm Cole oh wow. <laughs> Anyway, so Denise does what she does best. She grabbed the camera and videoed it. <laughs> but it was so funny because as he got back down, the dog and, and the, the farmer herded him back into the, to, to the farm. But this young one at the back decided to do a runner. So as it got in, man, he come back running at us. And I said, look at that, the dog's chasing him. Okay. So we had quite a few of those days. Yeah, Says to me, say, mate, I've left the flock at home and now I'm, flock. I'm chasing this flock. <laughs> anyway, we had a good time. Hallelujah. Anyway, uh, if you're with us today in mind and spirit, we're in the book of Philippians still, and we're in chapter one. We've been looking at in the last few weeks and one of the main themes that I, I believe has been coming out of that is joy. Remember we looked at the joy of the Lord and, and we looked at how we can experience joy and, and the joy is different than happiness. Remember all that? Because we're happy because of our circumstances <coughs> and, and we try to achieve that but it ends up you can't keep up with it but the joy that we're talking about is knowing that having that inside us that even in the midst of our troubles in the midst of our circumstances we still have the joy of the Lord and that joy is not a happy clappy joy it can be but it's knowing that God is with us <coughs> is for us amen. and he's working in our situations amen, amen. amen. and um, and then we looked at last week in partnership with God. Let me just find what I, the notes I have for that. And I can read it out to you. The trouble is my Bible's falling apart. There we go. I'm not going to go through all of it, so you can relax. Philippians 1.5. We looked at last week. And it says, For your fellowship... In the gospel from the first day until now and we, we read that word fellowship in the new living translation is partnership and because we're looking at the marks of the christian life and we said this mark was christian partnership philippians chapter 1 verse 5 but your fellowship or partnership in the gospel from the first day until now we saw that this word fellowship is koinonia i hope i've said that right mm -hmm. and it literally means fellowship or a common participation see it's too often we get distracted with fellowship because we think fellowship is having food and, 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 and you know and that's can be part of it but what paul's talking about is partnership in the gospel so that kind of fellowship. We say we were partners in, in grace. 
For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. That's the human nature, Amen. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. That's the human nature, but what we've done. But what our church has done. But what our denomination has done. But we apparently in God, in grace. Because yeah. the Bible says we all fall short. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And you and I, we, we learned last week, we also owe a common debt to the grace of God. Anyway, I'm not going to go through all that because, you know, if you want any more, then get on YouTube and pick it up there. Oh, it wasn't here last week, was it? No. Somebody was away eating chocolate and chasing <laughs> giraffes. <laughs> oh, no, I've lost my nose now because they have distracted me. Time I saw you know. I agree with you. I've only got one hand. We're going to buy a brand new one. We've got a brand new one. We just need the road to know how to set it up. I know it's better day to go. I promise you. Excuse me. I've got too many. Take your time, Pastor. Too many notes. Just fill with me a message. Come out in the name of Jesus. <laughs> chapter 1 and it's quite a big portion so be patient verse 12 through to verse 30 Philippians 1 verse 12 he says well I want you to know brethren that the things which happened to me Paul speaking have have eventually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel he kind of touched on that last week didn't he? sometimes the things we go through actually promotes the gospel Amen. Even if it's persecution. Amen. Don't forget, the gospel was sent around the world because of persecution. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, not that God sent the persecution on the church, but that he, he, he took advantage of it and he used it for the, the uh, growth of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Verse 13. So that has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ and most of the brethren in the Lord having become confident by my chains are much more bold to speak the word without fear some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife and some also from goodwill the former preach Christ from selfish ambition not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains but the latter out of love knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. Hallelujah. And in this I rejoice. Yes, and will rejoice. Don't forget we said this is the, the letter of joy Amen. and rejoicing. And you see it often here. Paul is, is uh, rejoicing and will rejoice. Verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. That's a Father tremendous Jesus. Amen. Jesus. Amen. Tremendous. Paul was saying, I'm going to rejoice anyway. Yes. Whether I live or whether I die, yeah. God's Jesus. going to be glorified. Jesus. And he says... Verse 21, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labour. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. 
For I am hard pressed between two, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you for all your progress and joy of faith. Hallelujah. Verse 26, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Verse 27, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come to see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs and that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and, and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. The title of this sermon today is The Habit of Joyful Living. Hallelujah. Make a habit out of it. Get up in the morning, go to the mirror, say, face, you're going to smile. You're going to enjoy this day. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You ever woke up dreading the day? No? You've never, you never dread getting Amen. up? Amen. I was talking to our eldest son, Peter, the other week, as he started his, his new post in the same job, but in a different wing, and it was, it was like night and day. And he's been in this job, and he thanked God for it, over two years, two and a half years, but it was a, a horrendous, violent work experience. Every day he went in fighting and, and violence and all that. And then it, I, I phoned him, I said, How's your new post? Oh, Daddy said, you wouldn't believe the difference. Thank you, he said, I, I'm going in this week and the inmates are, are cooking me a meal. <laughs> he said, that's how friendly it is. It's, you know, they're all, I don't know what they call them, they're all um, the good ones, the good convicts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the ones that have made a few mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> made big mistakes, some of them, but yeah. they're, they're doing okay in, in there. Yeah. And anyway, so the point I was trying to make was that he said, you know what, Dad, it's so different. He said, I used to wake up in the morning dreading going to work. I had this dread, but I need the job. He said, I like the job, but anyway, he said, it was dreadful, but now I wake up excited to go to work. Oh, Jesus. Amen. Jesus. It's so good, that, isn't it? Thank you. And, and like I said earlier on, we've got to remember when we're talking about joy, we're not talking about happiness. Happiness is different to joy. Happiness depends on our circumstances. How much we have in the bank, how much in the cupboard. Can we do holidays? Can we do, you know, things like that. And if they're taken away, some people go down. So we're looking at the habits of joyful living and we're looking at how can we measure maturity as believers. Christian maturity, it's what it takes, friends, to rob us of our joy. If you are immature, anything's going to rob you of your joy. Have you ever heard the term kill joys? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Do you know some? Yeah. <laughs> well, you're not one of them. Yeah. No. <laughs> kill joys can steal our joy. <coughs> the definition of a kill joy, it says that it's one who spoils the pleasure of others. Mm. You, do you know any of them? Yeah. 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 There's always someone who wants to put a wet blanket on what you're doing. Yeah. And sometimes when you do Christian endeavours, I've been out on the streets or we've done concerts and we've done stuff, and it's the Christians that come, oh, you know, not going to work. There's nobody coming. There's nobody out here. Listen, one day, Christian, two single Christians, two of them, came.
came knocking at our door at 8 o'clock at night in Bedsit land. The rest of the church sent them out and 40 of them stayed and prayed because they were too scared to do what they wanted to do. But God honoured it. And instead of going around the, the block saying, oh, the church is not behind us, the church are all stay, they're all cuddled together with hot coffee and we're out here in the bedsit land and it's getting dark, it's eight o'clock at night. Blah, blah, blah. But God had a plan Amen. for me and Denise. Amen. Amen. What seems silly to the world, God used. Amen. And you've got similar stories, I know. And these killjoys will come along and say, oh, it's never going to happen. Oh, it's never going to do this. Oh, you know, there's not enough coming. Oh, they, you, know, you know, and they'll kill whatever you're trying to do. Mm. And we've got to stand our ground. Exactly. There's different killjoys in our life. You know, one of the biggest killjoys in, in a Christian's life, it's very practical. It's called pain. You ever try to do anything when you're in pain? Have you ever had a bad back or, Jesus. you know, the last few years I seem to have all the aches and pains and all at once. Seems to have one in the hand, that's the old man. You know, I, I, I'm at that age now where getting up in the, ah, Wendy said to you, I can't get up out of it. And they all laughed, the grandkids, you know, I said, it's not me, it's your silly settee. It's only a foot from the floor. <laughs> <laughs> but all the aches and pains and, you know, I know uh, just a few months ago when I had this, this is a mouthful, man. Uh, it's called plantophysiitis, Joseph will know. Oh, plantophysiitis. Yeah, he'll say it right, he'll say it. Plantophysiitis. Yes. Yeah, and it's one of the most painful things. Amen. I've had fysiitis in my foot. Uh -huh. and, and, and when I first got it, I woke up in the morning, I couldn't put my foot Amen. down. It was so painful. Amen. I was almost going to say it's worse than childbirth. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do I know about that? <laughs> <laughs> the hardest thing I got to do in childbirth was cutting our Daniel's cord. And it wasn't a very, it sounds very romantic, but it wasn't a very nice thing. <laughs> it was like cutting an old piece of rope <laughs> with a smile on my face. <laughs> <laughs> No, I did it, John. <laughs> but there's nothing worse when we're in pain. Amen. Yeah. Something bothering us. It can stop you doing what God wants you to do. It can stop you uh, doing your, your daily things. Pain is a killjoy. Do you know what another killjoy is? You'll like this one. Petty people. Mm. Petty people, do you know any of them? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Don't let yourself be one. No. no. Petty people. Yeah. I, I, you know, I've seen I've seen ruptures in churches I've been in over petty things. Amen. Petty Amen. things. Amen. That's my chair. We always sit there. Mm. That's our cup. We do the tea. I've had people walk out of the church because they do the tea. And somebody else did it. I mean, I count it a joy now when someone says, don't you, don't we'll do it. Oh, like the Jesus. Don't, don't they really, didn't like it. Don't they really petty. Matter, don't really matter as long as the tea gets poured. That's right, Mark. But if you're petty, yeah. it's a big thing. The mother used to say, don't make mountains out of molehills. Amen. 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 Amen, yeah. Another one along with pain and pettiness is this, pressures. Mm. Pressures in your life. Yeah. Pressures internal and external. Mm. Sometimes the internal. You know, this is why a lot of people have breakdowns. Because they internalise it and the pressures of life. I've met people and I know people that have, have had a good life and then something's happened and they've had a breakdown yeah. mm. and some of them never recover yeah. mm -hmm. mental breakdown mm. external pressures what's external pressures well it, it's jobs it, it's paying the mortgage paying the bills 
doing the daily chores, looking after your family, whatever it may be, then pressures come on our life. That's why you're best not reading the papers a lot on the news. Yeah. That's right, Mark. I don't read them at all. No. True. Very they're they're yeah. boring now. Sometimes I look at the headlines and I yeah. walk past, but, yeah. you know, it doesn't help, does it? Because all it... You see, the newspaper is never good newspaper. No. It's always bad news, isn't it? Yeah. We used to deliver a Christian paper through the door, a free paper, and it was called The Good News. Yeah. Because people are fed up of bad news. Mm, yeah. And it was full of all different things, and a lot of the things in it were testimonies of regular people who sent in how God had changed their life, how God had done a miracle, how God had healed them, how God had brought, yeah, like Peter would be saying, a job in his life. And now that Covid's took more of a back seat, they're trying to scare me. Yes, it will do. Monkeypox and polio. <laughs> <laughs> trying to scare you me. You're reading too many newspapers. <laughs> it does, do. it does succeed. <laughs> so internal and external pressures. These can be killjoys in our life. If you allow it. One thing I've learned about Especially like a breakdown and things like that. It's not always, but I think it's a, a big contributor to it. Is when you sit there and you go over it and over it in your mind. You think about it all the time. And it's talking about what you're focusing on. You can dwell too much, yeah. And what you focus on, you magnify. And what you magnify gets bigger. <laughs> And sometimes I find myself drifting into these downward spiral of whatever it could be. I have to wake myself up. Put on a, 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 a sermon or music or something like that in my car. We put on some music. Whether it's Christian, I, I mean, we like to listen to it. And it's the only time I listen to radio is in the car. And we always put Smooth FM on. It relaxes us, you know, and we enjoy it. it. Takes our mind off those things that are pressurizing us. But if you don't, you know what? You know what these pressure thoughts lead to? Problems. Mm -hmm. It leads to problems in your health, in your life, in your relationships. And these are just some of the kill. I'm sure there's more. Just some of the killjoys. That we have to face in our life. You see, the Apostle Paul, well, it is spiritual maturity, is evident in the fact that he makes it very clear that the difficult, the unpleasant, the painful, even life threatening circumstances that Paul experienced, listen to this, didn't rob him of his joy. But he says it's actually caused the increase in the gospel. Amen. Amen. And Paul is our prime example this morning of how to be joyful no matter what our circumstances are. Yeah. People will think you might be being joyful in bad circumstances but we have to learn to thank God in all situations the Bible says be joyful always and again I say rejoice like I said instead of focusing on the negatives in our life instead of bemoaning our situation or worrying Worrying is just negative faith. Worrying about... Paul could have been worrying about his impending death. But we learned last week and week before that the Apostle Paul chose joy. Amen. He chose it. Amen. That's why I said, get up, look in the mirror and say, today, you're going to be happy. <laughs> I'm going to choose to be happy today. Amen. We were laughing about going out and 
We've been, like I say, we've just been up to our Jennifer's caravan for a few days. And, you, you know, in this country, you can you get all your packed lunch and you get your, you know, when the sun is shining, you get in the car, go down the road, and big black cloud comes and... <laughs> you can get it all in a day. <laughs> but we've learned to work with that, haven't we? Mickey was telling me he's gone with his daughters and a daughter and son and, and the grandkids and, and he went out for the day on Saturday. You know, and it got rained on. So you've got to change your plans quickly, get everybody inside and cost you a lot more because they want yeah. all the rides and the amusements and all that. Yeah. But that's the way it is. We've got yeah. to choose that it's not going to ruin our day. We're going to choose joy. Paul chose to focus on how God has used his situation to spread the gospel. Amen. Paul says in verse 27, he says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Stop moaning. Or be moaning. Yeah, you know, develop the habit of joyful living. And, and the very fact you have to develop it is something that has to be worked at. Amen. I laugh sometimes because you go to church and, or you go to a, a meeting or something and you end up sat next to, I know it doesn't happen in here, but you sat next to somebody who winds you up or rubs you the wrong way. But I learned from my pastors that God will put you next to someone because yeah. when they rub you the wrong, the wrong way, they're smoothing you out. <laughs> Iron sharpens iron, amen. It might be unpleasant for the time, but God's doing something. Amen. Next time you sing, do something new, Lord. <laughs> Remember who you sat next to. So let's look at some habits of joyful living. Habit number one, you have to look at life through God's perspective. See, the way we look at a problem is far more important than the problem itself. Joyful people have a larger perspective and a bigger world view. And this, this is what it is with Denise. She's always got scriptural view. Yes. Amen. You could say, you know what, have you seen it over there? They're bombing everyone, they're killing everyone. The planes are the planes are not taken. Oh well and she'll give you a scripture. Amen. It's quite annoying sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> because you want to wallow in your flesh. <laughs> but I know she's right. Amen. 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 Because she's looking at it through God's, I'm confessing it here, Denise. I'm on preaching that one. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. See, when you and I don't have the big picture, we don't see things from God's point of view. We don't see things from God's perspective. Oh, yes, there is war in, in, in the world. There's lots of wars going on. The Ukraine is not unique, is it? You know, we've, we've gone through Afghanistan, we've gone through Iraq, we've gone, you know, these places in Africa that are at war, and, and all those things. <coughs> yeah. The media wants us to concentrate on one thing and explode it. It can be anything. It doesn't have to be war, it could be sport. Your favourite team. Not doing as good as you thought they would. Mm. Well, that's not City, though, because they're doing really good. <laughs> that gave me a bad taste mark in my throat to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I surrender. Yeah. <coughs> that can all change in an heartbeat next season, though. 
See, but if we focus on the negatives, folk, we're going to get discouraged. We're going to get frustrated. We're going to become unhappy. Why? Because we can't see what God's really doing. Jesus. Jesus. We can't see how God's working in our situation. I've, I've long said, Lord, whatever it is, what your will be done. Some, some things that happen in our lives, we can't change, we can't stop. We said the other week, there's nothing worse than that hopelessness of not being able to control or powerless is the word I should use. You're powerless to do something. And that's worse than what we've, we've actually, or we're actually going through. Yeah. But last, we learned last week, and I'm going to say it again. No matter what we're going through as believers, as people of God, no matter what's happening in our lives, you've got to understand that God is working. Amen. God Amen. is working. Even though you and I can't see it, you've got to look at things like Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And if you're feeling forsaken, if you're feeling all alone, you've got to look at that and say, you know what, even though I can't see God working, I know he is. Amen. I'm going to activate my faith in his word. And, and this situation is not going to break me. Yeah. Things can go wrong in your life. Did you know this, that God can use anything in our lives? Amen. God can use anything. Listen to this. This is a bit controversial. God can use even my sins to get me where he wants me to be. God can use our faults. And God can even use our bad choices. I told you not to marry him. I told you not to bring him home. The times I said that to my kids, he ain't no good for you, she's no good for you. Only to be told, Dad, I'm an adult. <laughs> well, that like one. <laughs> Dump him. <laughs> 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 Only a dad can say that. <laughs> <laughs> See, God can use anything. Your sins, your faults, your bad choices. You know God can use what other people do to you? Amen. Oh, now that's an hard one, isn't it? Amen. I'm not letting them off that easy. No. They've said this, they've done that, they've treated me badly. But God can use that to get you to where he wants you. Amen. And he can take your circumstances and weave them into his greater plan for your life. And dare say even their life. Because God can take it and use it for your good and their good. Listen to this in verse 12. It says, but I want you to know, brethren, he's speaking to the believers here, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Now this doesn't, you know, oh you say they can walk all over. No, they can't walk all over you. But sometimes just let God's grace work in your life. And, and turn it around. It doesn't mean that you've got to bow down and be whipped and, and, and humiliated. Sometimes we speak up. Not in an aggressive way. I tell you what, Denise will tell, confirm this. Yesterday, we had a lovely week, and then we, we in the morning yesterday, we packed our bags. I loaded the car up. I said, right, before we set off, because it's over, it's about two hours journey. Let's go and get a bit of breakfast. See us on the for the day. So we went to this lovely place that we go. It's like it's like a it's like a Church of England church in this village. And then you go down the side road. We found it just by accident uh, a few years ago. And as you go down, there's an old mill and it's a tourist centre. It's really nice. And it's just got a little 
do it in car park. So I said, it's always busy today. Not usually that many cars. So there was a spot just in the corner at the far end of it. And I parked there. So we went up the stairs into the cafe. We had what, breakfast and stuff. And Denise wanted a second cup of coffee. So I said, you have your coffee and I'll go and bring the car up. So I got down to the car. Not one, but two cars had parked directly in front of me. And I'd gone round there and I'd measured it. How am I going to get out of here? I'm going to go across it. And it was stumps. I thought, no, I'm going to lose my exhaust. And anyway, I went back and said to him, I'm blocked in. Man, there's only two other tables. People at two other tables. And I said, I'm blocked in. Can you believe two cars have blocked me in? So anyway, I went back. And it got to, Denise came down, it got to about 20, 25 minutes. Denise went in the tourist shop. I didn't know she spoke to the woman. So I thought, oh, there's nearly half an hour now. And I'm getting a bit agitated. So I went into the shop and I said to Denise, I can't believe somebody has parked in front of my car like that. And the woman's like, <laughs> she said, it's staff, that's a staff car park. I said, well, I'm sorry, there's no signage whatsoever. She said, no, but that's where we park. So I said, so you've purposely parked in front of my car? She said, well, there's nowhere else to park. So I said, well, you'll have to, she said, and the woman at the front has took a dog for a walk. <laughs> but she said it with a grin on her face. My, I tell you. Good job Denise was there, because I could feel the Holy Spirit saying, don't say, don't do it. When she's grinning, so I said, but there's no signage. Well, that's got nothing to do with us. That's what she said to me. Oh no, she said, that's not my problem. I said, it might not be your problem, but it's my problem that I can't get out. She said, well, that's our space, and so it's not our problem. I said, but your space has got no signage to say this is staff. And it wasn't, it, she just, that's where they used to park it, used to park it. Anyway, so I'm going back to the car, Denise is still in the shop, and uh, I didn't know Denise had spoke to the woman. And the woman actually said, you know what the woman said to me? Denise said, so have you parked there on purpose? She said, yes. Yeah. Mm. I said, it's a good job you didn't tell me that when I was in the shop. <laughs> So I come out and this woman come walking up with a dog. And she walked past the car and passed me and said, excuse me, is that your car? She says, yes it is. I said, well, it's not very nice parking like that, is it? You block, I've been stood here half an hour waiting to get out. I said, that's where we park. I said, what, in front of all these cars? You park in front of me, two of you. Oh, I was ready to go, Joseph. <laughs> so the woman come running out then, the other woman who was being cheeky. As long as you get in the So they moved the cars, but they had to reverse out. They didn't like that. And I don't know why I was telling that story. There was a point to it somewhere. Paul was saying that uh, these things happened to me and uh, turned out to be gospel. So in the, in the end, you know, inside me I wasn't very gospel, but we drove away. Is it something connected to the killjoy? Killjoy? Oh, I was going to kill something. <laughs> it took me halfway home to keep saying, I just don't understand how so people can be so rude. <laughs> Let's go back! <laughs> See, Paul experienced bad things in his life, but he allowed God to turn it around for good. Amen. You know, he spoke about Paul being in prison. And Paul was a, a royal prisoner. And they gave him a royal guard. And guess what? This gave Paul access to those that he would never speak to. Yeah. 
I did have a verse in, but it but let's see. And then I should have written it down. There it, there it goes in verse 13. It says, So that it became evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Amen. And so Paul got a chance to speak to the guards in the prison. And they passed it on to the families. Yeah. And they passed it on to the soldiers. Amen. Amen. You know, and this would never have happened if he wasn't in that situation. So he could have said, oh, you know, I'm serving God. I give up everything for the gospel. And here I am in prison, falsely accused. But he said, no. I used it for the advantage of the gospel. Romans 8, 28. Glory to God. Amen. This talks about thinking. And that kind of thinking in the gospel is the opposite to what the world calls stinking thinking. What's stinking thinking? It's a bad attitude. It's a negative thought. Paul said in verse 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. It's something that we know. Like the joy of the Lord is our strength. But we know that, we know it, that God's going to do something. I often say, well, our children have maybe lost jobs, or, or you have, and I'll say, God's got something better for you. I'm not being sarcastic. I just know that God has done it in my life many times. And others that I know. Why? Because all things are working together for good. All things are working together for good. Even when we get negative uh, results, you've got to trust God. You've got to trust God. Yes. Because if we love God and we're called according to His purpose, He promises to weave. Everything that happens in our lives for good. Amen. But it has to be in his way and in his time. Amen. Because no. if we did it in our timing, we'd make a right mess of it. Absolutely. And I've learned one thing, the Holy Spirit is never late. He's never early. He's never late. No. We used to sing, he came through right on time. Amen. No. What's that chorus? Look what the Lord has done. Yes. He healed my body. He healed my mind. Amen. He came through right on time. Amen. Amen. See, we've got to <coughs> form that habit in our life of trusting God. Of turning it around. David did this many times. You know, when he got into situations, he looked back into his life and saw how God helped him through. He said, when... when the lion and the bear come. God give me the strength to defeat him. Amen. You know when he stood before, um, what's he called? Goliath. Hmm? Goliath. Goliath. He stood before Goliath. And that's what he thought. Hang on. Jesus. Yeah. You might be big to everyone else. You might be bigger than me, but you're not bigger than my God. Because the same God that delivered me from the lion and the bear will Amen. deliver you. Yeah. He chopped his head off. Not David's, Goliath's. Yeah. See, this kind of thinking, folks, I hope it's helping you say, this kind of thinking allows you and I to see not just with our physical eyes, but it helps us to see yeah. with the eyes of faith. Oh, yes. That's the key. With the eyes of faith. And that's God's perspective, not just our own. And that attitude allows us to remain joyful. Even when things seem to be falling apart. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Amen. And very quickly, don't let others control your attitude. Verse 15 and 
16, 17, it says, Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defence of the gospel. Now there's quite a lot in that we're not going to get into today, but it speaks about in our lives we're going to have critics. No matter what you do sometimes, critics. Amen. Even when you're doing good for people, someone will say, who does he think he is? And they'll twist your good intentions into bad. It's that slandering you. Those that were slandering Paul and creating all kinds of controversy. Amen. Listen, he said again, verse 15, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife. Amen. I like the New Living Translation. He says these words. He says, it is true that some preach Christ, listen to this, because they are jealous and quarrelsome. Jesus. Jesus. Mm. Quarrelsome. Literally means contentious. Amen. It literally means strife. Amen. Debate. Quarrelsome. You ever met those people? And I've met a lot of Christians like this. They love to debate. We've got a friend of ours. God bless him. <laughs> he loves to debate. You get with him and it's always something controversial. He loves to debate. Mm. And I have often say to him, I've no time for this, really. Yeah. Let's do something good for the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Because he loves to be contentious. And I've learned this from that scripture there. It says, um, because they are jealous and quarrelsome, that shows that when people are usually critical of us or they criticise usually it's from a spirit of jealousy Jesus. they're jealous of us Jesus, Jesus. and people who are jealous of you whether it's in your work, in your, in your friendships in your church, whatever they want to drag you down Jesus. Jesus. you see as human beings we all want to be loved we all look for approval don't we, most of the time most people want to be loved and they look for approval. And we want everyone to love us, but it's not always that way. Amen. But I'm learning, however, that we don't always need people's approval Jesus. to be joyful. Jesus. Amen. 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 Nor do we need their permission mm -hmm. to be joyful. I've had people get mad at me in jobs. You know, I worked on the buses that, uh, at Wee Steppo when it used to be there. And I remember we, they came in with the first set of um, redundancies. They were trimming down <clears throat> over, over Greater Manchester. They was laying off 1,500 staff. Not just drivers and conductors, but all, overall. And everybody's in a panic. And I remember this man coming up to me saying, what are you looking so happy about? I said, nothing. We're all losing our jobs. I said, I'm not bothered. Amen. What? I said, I'm not bothered. God will provide. Oh, God Amen. will provide Amen. for you. Amen. I said, well, you choose to be miserable, worrying about not having a job, and I choose to trust God. But if I don't have a job, he's got another one better for me. And he did. Amen. In, in fact, I did a silly thing. I packed him a job before the redundancy money came through. <laughs> so I didn't get it. <laughs> but I was happy. I was serving God in a different situation. There always be those, you know, I choose, I chose, I should say, to be joyful. I'm not asking for permission. Show joy, show joy over despair. Yeah. So you've got critics, then you've got good guys. Get any good guys in here today? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, time <laughs> Be careful what you say. 
Because God is listening. Amen. Amen. We spoke about earlier, I'm going to wrap it up as quick as I can, about the people that want to partner with us. Those that wanted to partner with Paul in his ministry of the gospel were his comrades and his friends. And it, those that stood with him, those that supported him, those that suffered with him. And it's like you're saying, don't worry, Paul. We've got your back. That's the kind of people you want yeah. behind you. Don't forget, Paul said, some are preaching from strife and envy, but others, the form, preach Christ. They want, they want you to add to you. They don't like, you know, people don't like to see you successful. Jesus. <laughs> I've, I've heard some people say, you know, Oh, you know, this church has got 900 people in. Mm. Oh, they're just egotists. It is. Yeah. Well, it's, give me that ego. Mm. They didn't just come knocking on the door, 900 people. Somebody had to do something. Amen. Amen. Somebody had to partner with them. Somebody had to be there for them and pray for them and give and, and do all the outreach and do all those things that it takes to grow a church. Amen. People that's got your back. Good guys. Guys and gals. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Who are the good guys in your life? Who have you given permission to stand for you, to stand with you. Yeah. Then you've got competitors. You meet this often in, in ministry. Where leaders make ministry all about them. Have you ever been there? Have you ever seen that happen? I have. Yeah. It's all yeah. about them and their, their uh, image and I met one pastor one time. We had a pastor's um, seminar in Stoke-on-Trent. And these people came from America. And there's nothing against Americans, but... Thank you. What was he called that pastor? <coughs> anyway, you won't know him. But part of his ministry was he stand up and brag about what God's doing in his ministry. Then he'd get people in his ministry to stand up and say, oh, what wonderful man he is. I mean, literally. And how they've been blessed under his ministry. Mm. And I was just thinking, yeah, mate. Yeah. It might have been a case of virtue signalling, that sort of yeah. thing. Anyway. But some, some, it just thinks about them. They tend to put others down to build them up. Mm. Paul said, some of them, out of love, supported him, partnered with him, because they said they knew that he was appointed for the defence of the gospel. Yeah. Amen. 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 What's the competitors in your life? It's not always people. God has to compete sometimes with jobs and with yeah. friendships and with money and all those different things. Then there's the conspirators. This is the last one. The conspirators. These are the troublemakers in our lives. One man said that emotional terrorists mm. who use witty remarks, sharp words, insults, threats, manipulation, control and gossip to mess us up and make our problems worse. You ever had someone who says the words can cut you up? Amen. The words can tear you down. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. The words can mess you up bad. Paul was experiencing that. He said these come the former ones. They, he said they preach Christ from a selfish ambition. 
They're not sincere, supposing to add to my chains. Now, don't really, this is not to say, look at that person, look at that leader, they're conspiring against me. We've got to look at it. The devil's behind it all. Amen. He's conspiring to bring you and I down. Amen. He wants to neutralize us. He wants to separate us. Jesus talked about the sheep. He said, you know, for the wolves to get the sheep, they separate the weak and the young yeah. and the feeble lamb from the flock so they can devour it. Yeah. And that's how the devil works in our life. He wants us to get mad at the leadership. He wants us to get mad at our friends. He wants us to get mad for such silly things. Amen. See, today as we close, I want you to think of this when you go. Speak for yourself. I'm going to focus on Christ. And I'm going to choose joy. Paul oh, says in verse 28, I'm not in any way terrified by your, adver by your advers adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, Amen. but to you of salvation mm -hmm. and that from God. He's saying that these bad things are, are not happening to you because God's mad at you. Amen. Amen. They're happening to you because the devil's mad at you. Jesus. A lot of the things I've experienced as a believer, I never experienced before. I got saved. Amen. Right. <clears throat> and and mainly it's because my eyes were opened and now I, I, I see, you know, the devil was attacking in many ways. See, Paul said, it's not only being granted to you and I to, on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict you saw in me, Paul said, and now hearing me. See, as believers, as we close, I want to say this statement. As believers, it's a privilege to suffer when we're doing the right thing. And it's a privilege to suffer with Christ and for Christ. We can't let other people control our attitude and steal our joy. Paul knew and he wants you to do that today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't let the devil steal your joy. Amen. Don't let anybody else he wants you to steal your joy. It doesn't say, he's, you know, but there's going to be things that happen. But if we turn it over to God, he's going to turn it around for our good. Amen? Amen. Don't look at what's happening now. Just say, God's promised me. God's promised me. Jesus said, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. You know, when Peter came to Jesus and tried to stop him going to the cross, Jesus looked right through Peter, looked over his shoulder, and he said, get thee behind me, Satan. He wasn't talking to Peter, but the circumstances, the situations. And we can do the same thing. We can say, you know what? You're not going to win. You're lying devil. Get thee behind me. Today I choose joy. Amen. I choose joy. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Father God, we thank you right now. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that you gave your life a ransom for each and every one of us. And that we've all been bought with the price of the precious blood. And we know, Lord, that you're never going to leave us nor forsake us, but you're going to bring us through. We're going to, have, we're going to be more than conquerors through you, Lord that loved us and died for us. And so today, Lord, I pray for these words, Lord, to be uh, so deep in hearts today, so deep in spirit, in mind, so that when these um, activities come against us, we'll stand strong and we'll know that I'm going to be choosing joy. Joy of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we give Jesus a big hand this morning? He's worthy, hallelujah.